So, sisters and brothers, we've all lived through the near war crisis that uh, happened a couple of weeks ago. What happened to that? Uh, the president was on TV practically begging for the right to go to war. And uh, that's all changed, and we're in a new phase. We, we're pretty confident that that's going to happen anyway. In the meantime, we have a report back tonight from um, Sarah Flounders. She's the uh, Workers' World Secretariat member and IAC International Action Center co-director. She's just back from Syria. She was there with a part of a U.S. anti-war delegation that included uh, former U.S. Attorney General Ramsey Clark, former Georgia Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney, IAC West Coast Director John Parker, and others. Um, and she's got a very important report to give on that right now. This is, as was described, a preliminary report. Uh, we're just back last night and uh, still evaluating a very important trip coming at a very crucial time. Syria is in the midst of an all-out war on many fronts. And you could say that the whole country is a war zone, and that means not only all the cities are targets, every road is a target, and there's no such thing as a civilian area versus a military area. By the U.S. own measures, uh, there's 1,200 of these militia bands, these organized, extremely well-funded mercenaries and thugs from all over the region and wider and they're being armed they're being trained in all kinds of equipment use in Jordan and in Turkey material is flooding in from Saudi Arabia and many other places so it's a US orchestrated war And it's important to recognize that U.S. imperialism's most effective, most persuasive representative, and I'm talking about President Obama, he really is their, their most effective representative in a generation and more. And yet, he failed on every front to gain support for U.S. war. Failed overwhelmingly in the U.N. Security Council, at the G20 meeting in Moscow, even with NATO or the British Parliament, but most important with the U.S. Congress. It became impossible to move forward. They, they literally couldn't hold the vote because when they counted in advance, they knew it would be a debacle. Every congressional office was flooded. And the demonstrations that we had a real role in, in more than 48 cities in the U.S., and in helping to initiate this and reaching out and connecting, was very important. And a role was really played also with the Syrian Americans here in the U.S., who also mobilized. And that's a big and a new development. So Washington was forced to pull back for a time. Now, this is also you could say a war and a real confrontation that we saw coming long in advance. And two and a half years ago, we were organizing forums and meetings and picket lines and uh, publishing a pamphlet and that, that Joyce Chediak wrote, um, regular articles on what was at stake and who was responsible. And that this was an all-out effort at regime change, at destabilization, at U.S. domination of the region. But I really want to spend a lot of time describing the delegation. It's sometimes it's important to step back and explain why we do the things we do uh, and what role such a trip plays in a view of the anti-war movement. 
we're opponents of U.S. imperialist wars on every attack of our own ruling class on every front, domestically against racism and repression, internationally, regardless of the country that is being targeted. And every demonstration and picket line and public meeting is really to show opposition and to do so in a way that will unify and encourage others. Because every war and every attack takes place to isolate and marginalize whoever is the victim of the attack. So the, a delegation to Syria plays the same role, in another sense, as a demonstration, as a picket line. It's, it's a demonstration of solidarity. It's saying Syria is not isolated. It's an attempt to set an example and to confront the demonization of a whole country. It's an attempt to work with the alternative media and also to organize voices within the anti-war movement who are consciously trying to reject the arrogant imperialist demands for regime change. So a great deal of our challenge, it's a political challenge, is to help change the perception of what's at stake, to explain it in ways that people can understand it visits to a hospital where, and particularly we, we saw many soldiers who were targets of, of continual snipers attacks. Uh, people wounded from neighborhood defense uh, teams. We visited a, a family displaced persons center. This is a huge social problem in Syria. The, the insecurity of war forces whole families to flee with whatever they can carry, and they're desperate uh, just to stay together. I mean, what is the insecurity that families have in a time of war? Is how to hold on to everybody and somehow stay together and hold on to each other. That's what security is. It can be more important than eating and having a roof over your head, is to know where your children are where the elders and the seniors are. Are they taken care of? And so when people flee an area, it's literally what they can put sometimes in a sack, in a bag, squeeze into a car. There are four million internally displaced people in Syria. That's in a population of about 22 million. So it's a huge part of the population. There's about two million refugees outside of Syria, largely in Turkey. Now, one place that's used particularly for the displaced people are schools because both you're able to guard them and provide security. Very often each family, or sometimes it's two families, to a classroom, all sharing the bathroom on the hall. It's important because at a school you can provide cafeterias and medical clinics and classrooms, because what's most important for the children? That in the disruption of war, there's some of that structure and stability that still having classes provides, singing songs together and being with others of the same age and peer group. So these displacement centers at schools have both forced a number of schools to, to close and others open, or move students that might be at that school normally to somewhere where they're traveling further. So there's a lot of crowding and doubling up. But it's important to recognize that all the schools and all the classes, all the students in Syria today are in school. And classes continue. That's a, that's a big accomplishment. That's a big, big accomplishment. In a society that takes education extremely seriously, Education is free in Syria for everyone, and it includes university and medical school and graduate school. But it's the importance of giving structure to the youngest that is taken the most seriously. At this displacement center that we visited, I think almost every family there, a family member had been kidnapped by these roving bands. 
it's, it's a big source of income for these, these thugs. I mean, it's sort of like open season for anyone in the region to come through who can make money off of ransom, particularly targeted almost anyone who has extended family, who has a job in the Gulf or in the US or in Europe, because they might have someone they could pull on. It's not, it's not necessarily even a political act. If you can snatch a child and force the family or the extended family to ransom back that child or a son or a grandmother, anyone can be a target of the kidnapping, and they are. It's the, the ransom is part of the looting that's going on. We, we couldn't visit the city of Aleppo. It's a major city. It's really the most productive, the industrial center. Uh, for weeks now, Aleppo has been without electricity, without communication. That includes phone or internet. And with the convoys bringing basic food supplies constantly under attack by these rebel forces. Aleppo, extremely important. It's, it's almost right on the Turkish border. And, and these armed groups are able to come in in trucks and literally loot entire factories. Not just the goods in the factory, but the equipment and the communication towers and the satellite towers and almost anything that can be taken apart. And it's, it's done even in broad daylight in front of cameras. It's another because it can be sold and resold along with piping and tubing and all manner of, of materials. Now, I at the same time want to say that although we're visiting a country at war, there is every effort and it's a kind of a, it's a discipline, but it's also, also coming from every level to give an impression of calm. Not only are the schools open, the markets are open, the Syria has a, quite a system of very modern roads and highways and very impressive housing, very modern uh, housing. And all of that in, in Damascus in extremely good order. And, and we were told any kind of attack, there's an all-out effort to, like by the very next day, clean it and paint it and give, a, give a, an air of uh, normalcy. That's part of the war, too, to, to not psychologically bend. Uh, we had a very exciting visit to uh, an encampment uh, on Mount Kasayum. This was ta taken, it began on the day that it seemed that the U.S. attack was really, the bombing was going to come that night. And it was hundreds of young people this is the, the mountain that like overlooks all of Damascus and all the communication towers and TV towers and such are on this mountain. So hundreds of youth went up to that mountain and set up an encampment called Over Our Dead Bodies. It, it, it was a human shield and it was really um, a very heroic statement. They'd set up tents and they were determined to stay there during this whole period. And there are hundreds there at any time. Uh, and they have rotations and more than 100 people stay there at night, many hundreds during the day. A young woman who organized it, uh, we were able to do an interview with uh, Ogaret Dandash. She was interesting, actually, a Lebanese uh, woman who had helped to undertake, participated in a similar effort in Libya two and a half years ago. And there were other, we met other young people who had been involved in struggles in Gaza and, and Mavi Marmar, and shipments when the Palestinians were besieged. It's a, such an example of internationalism and struggle and struggles learning from each other and linking in together. Uh, it was actually a very interesting exchange because some of the people, for example, Cynthia McKinney, who had been there in Libya, they realized they knew each other. And, um, and also, um, 
to say I, I kind of looked up and saw those communication towers and realized, oh my goodness, um, my phone will work here. So <laughs> we were able to do a, an on-the-spot interview um, with this woman, with, with Andrea Sears of WBAI, and they played it by that night. We were able to take that same interview and send it out uh, widely all over the world. Uh, but it was interesting. We thought, well, this is, this is really great. We're going to get this word out um, by tonight, by tomorrow. Uh, but um, actually, by the time we were back off the mountain, I think we weren't even off. Somebody looked on their phone, and why the folks up there had already posted it all over Facebook. They were like way ahead of us. So that, that was also an interesting example of um, their ability to communicate. And we, by the way, we told them that this same day, right now, there are demonstrations going on with Occupy Wall Street in New York City that we learned from each other's struggles and from each other's encampments and resistance. And they were very excited to hear about that. Oh, where could we get information? And, you know, so. Um, now, there were also official visits. And I want to take up. Uh, we met with the Syrian president. Bashir Assad, and that's important in terms of standing up to demonization. What does the U.S. demand? It's for regime change. And U.S. imperialism can have the warmest relations with every absolute monarch, every corrupt force in the area, the king of Saudi Arabia and the emirs and the sultans, Absolute dictatorships, no elections whatsoever. And that's considered respectable and fine. When you look at the Gulf states, the majority, there's all these absolute monarchs, and yet the majority of the population are not even citizens. And Syria is the last secular state in the region. So it was an important meeting. We saw it as an important meeting to confront politically the demonization of Syria and their government for the crime of standing up to imperialism. I mean, in essence, that's really the crime, that Syria hasn't caved in. And the central US demand uh, is that President Bashir Assad must resign, must step down, that he lacks legitimacy, and that regime change is the only thing that's acceptable. The U.S. demand is that any future government include these criminal bans that they are directly paying and equipping. And any talks on a negotiated solution revolve around this. Who's legitimate? Who's involved? The U.S. demands that the Syrian government not be involved. And on the other hand, every one of the groups that they represent should be involved. So this is an issue that the movement here can't sidestep. And we're much stronger when we confront it head on. Not a secret meeting. The media was involved. They sent out pictures right away. So it was publicly covered. And anything that we did in Syria publicly covered. It's not secret. It turned out it was the same day, actually, that Fox News was giving big coverage to an interview between former Congressman Dennis Kucinich and President Assad. <coughs> and, and actually, Kucinich was, was there in Damascus at the same time that we were. So that was also important. We also had meetings with the Grand Mufti of Syria which is the Sunni's highest religious leader, who strongly for respect for all religious groupings. It's important because of the way in which uh, particularly Saudi Arabia has attempted to use uh, the Sunni forces within Syria, who are almost 80% of the population, and distort the issue, um, and distort it in religious ways. So the Grand Mufti 
of Syria plays a very important role, so much so that his son was assassinated because he refused to side with the Saudi view. And he was denied a U.S. visa. He was, he was scheduled to come here this summer in a whole series of meetings with religious leaders here, Christian and Jewish and Muslim, to talk about the mosaic that makes up Syria and the importance of respect for all religions. And was assured that his visa would come through. He went to Jordan to get it and it was directly stopped from the highest levels. It had been authorized in, in Jordan. We met with the leaders of the, actually the oldest Christian church in, in Damascus, a church dating back to the second century, now a Greek Orthodox church. The Christian population in Syria is about 10 to 12 percent. It's a very important minority uh, that sees itself directly threatened and very often targeted by this war. Now, the very fact and the idea of sending such a delegation to Syria, it will be attacked and will be baited and will be criticized in various ways. We can expect that. It goes with the terrain, shouldn't be bowled over by it. And especially by opponents who are part of the imperialist effort to keep Syria isolated. And our message is simply that Syria is not isolated, that there are countries and movements around the world that defend Syria from imperialist attack, and that includes even here in the imperialist center. And, and this is why our visit was also timed as a way of participating in a very important conference in Beirut the day before we went into Damascus. It was called the Arab International Forum Against U.S. Aggression on Syria and for resistance. And it was organized by uh, the Arab International Center for Communications and Solidarity. Oh, my time is running. Um, this forum in D.C. was, uh, it, it opened with representatives of the Lebanese movement, including Hezbollah, and then with George Galloway from Britain and Ramsey Clark, the U.S., and the ambassadors of Russia, and Lebanon and Syria and Nicaragua and Iran and movements throughout Europe and the Middle East from the US there were representatives there from ANSWER and UNAC and the International Action Center and there were strong resolutions put forward and then from the conference our small delegation which was Ramsey Clark, Cynthia McKinney, John Parker from the west coast of the International Action Center, myself from here in New York and Daydan Kamathi, who's with the All African People's Revolutionary Party in LA. And he also has an important program on KPFK Pacifica. And we're also joined by Johnny Achi from Arab Americans for Syria in Damascus. The invitation to, to go to Syria came from Syrian Americans we've worked with in demonstrations and educational forums. The tickets were through travel agency in Los Angeles and paid for by Syrian American doctors and others in the Syrian American community here. I, I say all this because it always comes up as a kind of a backhanded attack that we want to explain that this is part of the movement here, making a political statement and refusing to be isolated. Now, I just want to, in closing, touch a bit on the situation here, because now, because since what, what seemed the very eve of war, and if anybody who watched President Obama's talk there <coughs> that night, you didn't know if the aircraft had already taken off or not, given the, the tone of it. Uh, it's been made very clear at the UN Security Council, very publicly stated by Secretary of State Kerry, that military devastation of Syria is still absolutely on the table. And it seems a height of arrogance after this, but they're still demanding that any resolution on Syria at the UN Security Council approve military measures if Syria doesn't meet U.S. demands and timeline and inspection lines 
in exactly the way the U.S. wants. So they want a resolution that has, is really a war resolution. It's unlikely they'll get it, but we should ask why they're doing it, especially this week as the U.N. is back in session. And it's very important. Anytime there's a big international meeting, you could look at it, there's always a crisis where U.S. imperialism is threatening war. And that becomes the terms of debate. And that's what's going on now. The UN is in session this week. And it's an effort to really dominate all debate with charges against Syria. And that's really a way of also deflecting any discussion of the criminal US role, who on earth is organizing the effort to overthrow the government of Syria? The US, of course. But by making every discussion be on gas attacks, which even as the UN report shows, there's no way to confirm such an attack, where it came from, who's responsible for it. Sarin gas, we should remember the biggest sarin gas attack was a suitcase in a subway in Tokyo by a, a small sect some, some years back. Takes very little in terms of technology to spread gas. So this is really an effort while the UN is in session that the only topic of discussion is this war. And it's an old, old tactic as I say, pulled out before almost every international meeting, to create a crisis and then demand that every country align themselves with the world masters. And it's a kind of a tattered old script. Will it be effective? We don't think it's likely to be. But we should take the danger and the threat seriously. Now, we hope through this delegation that will be followed with articles, interviews, meetings, encouraging others to act and speak and write and keeping this on the front. I think a big impression that we all came back from Syria with is the way in which at every level, religious groups, community groups, teachers, doctors, there's acting with an air of confidence and determination. And it's a good lesson that we also act with confidence in our resistance to imperialist domination and confidently stating that no country can or should be isolated. And also acting with confidence that this is a new period. The anti-war movement, even when you think of the allies in the Syrian-American community, and almost every major city, now that didn't happen. It reflects part of the changing character, even of the population here in the US. You think back to the Vietnam War, but in the war on Iraq or on Libya, that didn't exist in the same force, where there were hundreds and hundreds of Syrian-Americans coming out and mobilizing and taking part in the demonstrations. That's significant, and we thank them. Arab Americans for Syria, the Syrian American Forum, and many, many other groups. We want to take recognition of the importance of the demonstration that took place in Washington, D.C. on the day Congress came back, right in front of the White House and that have taken place, whether in Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Detroit, Allentown, PA, where there's actually the largest Syrian-American community in the country. And we also <coughs> want to act with great confidence, because this is a new period in another way, that before the U.S. launched a war, there was opposition on such a scale I mean, larger even than could be reflected in the demonstrations. When congressional offices said, we're being besieged a thousand to one. When Nancy Pelosi announced, well, I intend to vote for war, but 95% of my constituents are telling me not to. That's, that's important.
because it was happening all over. And it gives us great potential to link this war, and this is something that we did in all of the media and interviews, and we had many, many interviews in Syria. They wanted to hear what, what do people from the U.S. say, what do they think. We could talk about the struggle here is for jobs and for health care and for schools right here, and that's what's destroyed in another war. That as Martin Luther King said, the bombs had fallen, Vietnam fall here, it's even more so true today because this is a system in such crisis. So saying that again and again here and there is a real message that was deeply appreciated there and it certainly resonates here in the U.S. Thank you. Sarah, you make us very much proud and really I hope the people know the real face of the U.S. citizen standing for the peace and you as a representative led by the Wednesday Clark and other great Americans and the European people who love the war, against the war and standing for the peace. Only one question I have, when you met the president of Bashar al-Assad, how do you feel that, do they have any idea regarding about the talking to their people and groups to settle down the problem? 13% Shia, Alawis, and the 60 more than percent Sunnis. So is there any sense you got that they have any plan to solve this problem? Because we are, same way when we are against aggression, the same way we are standing for the people of the citizen, they should have to choose their own government. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I just want to say that both report backs are really good and really important to think about. Um, my one question that I've been kind of baffling in my head, and I hope Sarah can answer, is in regards to speaking to the people and um, Bashar al-Assad, um, you know, with the idea of handing over um, like their weapons that they have and the agreement that's going on, um, I know that you know some people here feel like you know it's nothing to worry about. It's something like like Libya, um, while some Syrian Americans that I know feel like it is like Libya and what will happen if they do that. Now, I was wondering if you encountered anyone that talked about it, or even the president himself, and what they see for the future. You know, if you read the uh, corporate media, and um, it's like main spokesman, the New York Times, they'll always refer to like Syria being isolated and uh, all by itself, except for maybe Russia and Iran and maybe China. But there is tremendous international solidarity with Syria. And um, particularly in Latin America, where um, you know it happened to President Mor uh, Morales of Ecuador, of um, Bolivia, where his plane uh, was denied the uh, ability to fly over France and had to make an emergency landing in Austria. Most recently, just the other day, President Maduro of Venezuela. His plane was denied the ability to fly over Puerto Rico on an official trip to China. So, um, with all with all those insults, um, there on the other hand, there's tremendous solidarity um, with Syria and the Syrian people. Uh, recently, saw a very militant demonstration in La Paz, Bolivia, in solidarity with Syria and discussions in La Paz about if they know what's going on, you know, these places are not isolated anymore. But there's also militant solidarity. And a great example is Venezuela. Uh, Venezuela, a big oil producer. And um, in Syria, for the most part, there's no central heating. Uh, in the winters, which can be cold, people have individual units in each room or it's on wheels and can move it around. And it takes a certain type of um, fuel, petroleum. Uh, and that is also manufactured in Venezuela. And last winter, the winter before, it's you know cold in Syria. It's raw, biting wind. And uh, both winters, Venezuela sent their own oil tankers to, uh, from Venezuela to Syria to deliver oil so that Syrian people would be cold in the winter. And we, we should also particularly salute the workers on those ships because 
that was a dangerous voyage. You have to cross the Atlantic and then uh, go from one end of the Mediterranean to the other, the Mediterranean being almost like Lake NATO with the U.S. and, and NATO warships all over, air, aircraft all over, yet that ship determinedly sailed to the port of Latakia, unloaded oil, and returned to Venezuela. So um, we should, you know, thank the workers who were on that ship and thank the Venezuelan people for the sacrifice of sending oil to uh, Syria. The, the timeliness of this trip, I think it was, uh, it great that they went when they did, and also that they were able to get this interview uh, from the youth encampment up on Mount Cassium onto U.S. radio through WPAI and from there onto the internet uh, with that very same night. And there's a particular reason I say it's timely, and I'm not even sure that uh, Sarah would know about this because she would have already have been in Syria, the day before they went and met the young people up on the top of Mount Kassim, the front page article of the New York Times, which shows you that the thrust for a war is not over at all, was all about how there were unnamed experts. Who knows where they're from? Are they even from the United States? Who, no, they don't say who they are, or who are saying that Oh, it was Mount Cassium was where the rockets were fired from with the poison gas. Now, this is where all the television and, uh, and other communications stuff is. They were making it sound like it was the Pentagon up there. And there may be. I'm sure there's military stuff there, too. But, you know, are we supposed to believe that the Syrians are so stupid that they would fire from their main headquarters yeah. rockets with poison gas when that's the thing that, that was supposed to be the, the tipping point you know, for the US, uh, and, and that it could be traced back to them? That, that, that they say that these rockets, you know, that they have so, some kind of an angular way of tracing it back. Anyway, the most important thing is they're acting as though there's proof. They all talk about it as though there's proof. Nobody's seen this proof. No, nobody. Now that no, no members of Congress have seen it, nobody has seen it. You just are supposed to take their word for it. Well, I'll tell you, at this point, after Iraq, after mm -hmm. Libya, after people around the, and Afghanistan, people around the world are not going to say, oh, yeah, we'll take your word for it. We believe you. We must be right. They're going to say, this is a lot of bullshit. <laughs> Um, those were really good reports, and um, I'm so proud of Sarah and John and our comrades and, and Ramsey and all the people who went to Syria. And I was worried, you know, the night that they got there, they were going to bomb, you know, and I thought, those are my brave comrades. Those are people who understand anti-imperialism. But Jerry's comment reminded me of something, and also Michael, because in 2002, there was a movie made about the attempted coup against Hugo Chavez. And in the process of this movie, which is called The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, it's a wonderful movie, there's a part where the people of Venezuela are interviewed and they all say, no, we don't listen to the mainstream media, we don't believe in it, it's, we, no, it has nothing to do with us. It's all run by the rich people and has nothing to do with us. And I remember thinking in 2002 when I saw this movie, oh, I wish that we were like that here. You know, that would be really nice if people felt that way. And I feel that right now that is how people feel. I feel that right now people are very, very skeptical. There is a thing that the FBI has just come out with. It says now that you, they are going to be suspicious of people who don't accept the 9-11 story. And then they did a little report on this and they said it turns out they found that 48% of the people in this country are suspicious of the 9-11 story. <laughs> And it's kind of funny, and people were very upset, oh my God, that's terrible, I know so many people. But the fact of the matter is, this shows you, this skepticism is big, because that's just one part, that's the 9-11 story. There's all kinds of other skepticism, like how can the, you know, the Congress say that they're not gonna give you know, food to poor babies and old ladies? I mean, there's something really bizarre about that, and people know it. And all the, the threats of war, people are quite conscious that there's something wrong, 91% of the people opposed the war before they even knew too much about it. So I think what we have 
is a very, very significant thing. And also, I, I caught that thing about how the soldiers and the Navy, they don't want to be in this the, a war there either. And the United States is supposedly mustering 20,000 men from someplace close to go over there. So the boots on the ground. Somebody said they're going to wear Nikes. But the fact is that it's, going, it's really a very, very serious problem for the ruling class because everybody is not lined up like ducks in a row. We are s skeptical, we are suspicious, and we're t pissed off. And the fact of the matter is the FBI can't do a goddamn thing about it because, in fact, the more they do, the more skeptical people will be. I see from an activist in Ireland who actually said that they had, she spread the link, the, uh, link of Sarah's sound talk um, through her contacts in Ireland, but they had trouble reaching the link and she wanted to know how to keep the link going and something like that. There was also an email from an activist of an um, anti-war group in Hamilton that's very active. And they wanted to congratulate the uh, delegation, say how great it was, but then say, hey, we have this person who's been on the, the people who stand in front, like in Gaza, in front of the bulldozers and stuff like that. And if you have another one, please invite her to go too, and, but that type of thing. So those are just a couple small examples. There's also an interesting email from um, a Japanese labor federation that uh, represents three main uh, labor organizations in Japan. I don't really understand the whole thing too much. They're having a big action November 4th, but they listed a whole bunch of labor in action around the world, including uh, the ILWU's uh, effort in the West Coast and uh, several other things. Try to be brief, you know, j just on the Syria crisis and, you know, this tremendous trip that we made, you know, it may seem as though it's all died down, you know, with the deal and so forth, but this is an ongoing crisis. It's not going away, and it could flare up like that. As a matter of fact, we predict it will. We don't know whether it's tomorrow or whether it's the middle of October, but uh, you can bet whatever you can bet that it will flare up, It'll probably be before 2014. You know, so uh, uh, if you want to push it on the back burner for a half an hour, okay, but don't push it too far back because you're going to need to grab it. And uh, I hope we come up with, I mean, the tour is a nice idea, but I, I hope we come up with some imaginative and timely ways of, uh, of, 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 of using the trip and everything else that we've done uh, to uh, erect a bigger platform, you know, to, to deepen the anti-imperialist message and to rally the anti-imperialist forces. Uh, let me start with uh, what Larry was just talking about because it's really what we do in the struggle right here that is of the utmost importance and is a real test. And just as what we're talking about on Syria, we can be a small force and a spark and a force of mobilizing others by the way we take up an issue. The same thing is true with October 24th or the struggle against the banks in Detroit. How, how do you focus the attention of the movement here? The same thing we've been trying to do with people's power assemblies, whether in Baltimore or any other city or right here. So it's, it's extremely important how we're working with others because we're not a force alone. It's what's done in coalitions and to bring an idea alive. And we, I think we want to give a lot of attention to both Detroit and, and what's being attempted there and, and really think through what we can do here for October 24th. Because unless you're out in the streets, you don't. Sometimes the only way to really look at a piece of literature is if you're giving it to someone else. And then you're kind of seeing it through other eyes. Um, 
And I also want to say a lot about this sign that we have hanging up here. Stop the wars on Syria and black youth. Because making that link that there's a war here that's every single day and is deeply felt and, and whether it's stop and frisk or whether it's the police shootings or, or whether it's a, an attack on food stamps, there's no shame. There is no shame and there is no limit to what they're willing to destroy and take back. I mean, food stamps, that is sustenance. That is like the ability to eat. And they cut $40 billion out of it over a period of, I mean, they, they'd spend that in a few days in a war. It's not that it's not there. So that really is the war here and the war there. And making that link, if we're not making that link, it's really not real. Uh, now, I wanted to address a couple of things about back on Syria about how regional this war is. Um, I'm sitting there in this Marriott Hotel in Beirut waiting for the conference to start. And because it was kind of early morning, I was just having coffee sitting in the lobby right by the front doors. I was speaking to an Arab woman. Um, Actually, it was a, the daughter of France Fanon. But anyway, we're, so, so we're having coffee sitting there, and she pointed to the group who was sitting almost next to us, I mean, right by the front door, but it was about seven um, young men, very large. Any one of them looked like they would be a bouncer at a club, dressed kind of rough, and each of them with a big canvas satchel sitting next to them. Um, and she said, see those guys right there? They're from Chechnya. They're all on their way in. You'll see it, their, their ride is coming to, somebody will come by and pick them up just a little bit. It was true, it was true. So when I say that there's recruiting throughout the whole area descending into Damascus and how open the borders are and how openly it takes place. I mean, this is the Marriott in Beirut. Um, we should just be aware of what is flooding the area and it endangers Lebanon also. It endangers not only Syria. It, it, um now, will they succeed? They, they put quite an effort into organizing uh, a whole group in Jordan, the CIA, uh, just last week, and someone was describing, um, they didn't get past a few miles inside the border um, when they were dealt with. So, this is a struggle. It's a military struggle. It's a political struggle. The, the level of U.S. arms is increasing and the sophistication of them. There's, it was described to us both heat-seeking weapons, um, also even weapons that are attached to motion detectors, so even th that, that the U.S. is giving these forces. Now, um, I, just to answer some of the questions that were asked, um, in terms of uh, the meeting with, with President Assad, there was one very interesting part. Now, um, Bashir Assad was, was really not trained for political uh, life. He was a doctor, an eye doctor. And, and even some of the examples he gives are more medical in, in character. And so one of the things he said is, if you're dealing with cancer, you can't just cut, just spread. It takes a great deal of sophistication and care and precision. And everywhere that these bands are, you, if you just smash it, you, you attack a lot of civilians that are caught in the middle. Even civilians that may be aligned right now 
and confused with these forces. So it's constantly winning them over. And it's time after time also uh, providing amnesties again and again and again. Anyone who you know, uh, lays down their arms or says that they've switched sides or says that they're no longer fighting the government has been welcomed back. That's extremely, extremely important. Um, it's the Syrian government that has time and again said that they're very much for a negotiated solution. The opposition to a negotiated solution has come from the so-called Free Syrian Army. Free Syrian Army is so chaotic they can't meet with each other and they're, they're fighting each other almost as much as they're fighting the government when they're not looting each other and each other's equipment. But the government has always been, and, and in his statements he made it clear, a negotiated solution is the only way. We should know that the Syrian Communist Party is, is part of the government now, and, and many forces. Um, the other point he made was to describe, he said, Syria and the countries of the region are, are very much built on, on two pillars, socially. Um, both pan-Arabism and, and Islam. And it was what was so destabilizing was the pitting of the, the right-wing Islamic current against the rest of society. Now, I, I want to say something on that. How did that come about? Because this also came up in a real way in the discussion uh, that uh, the Grand Mufti of Syria had. And, and also when we met with these Christian forces, they, they stressed again and again how much Syria has historically been a mosaic of many different uh, religious and ethnic groups and currents who've lived together and have a history of that. Um, but there again, it's U.S. policy. U.S. policy that really began in both a response to the Iranian Revolution and the using of forces in Afghanistan as a way to mobilize the warlord forces. And, and was very much reinforced. It, it, it's not just Saudi policy, this mobilizing of the Wahhabi, you know, religious um, forces and Taliban. It, it, that, this is U.S. War College policy. This is, this is the Pentagon that it's coming from. It's part of the sectarian violence of, of how to destroy the resistance in Iraq was to pit Sunni against Shia, consciously. Put it on every ID card. Make it so you couldn't go from one block to the next. Every street corner divided. Parts of the country divided. The, the, the parliament by how many blocks, how many seats. Everything, everything divided. And that impacts the whole region. You feel it in Pakistan today, in, in, every, in every country in the region. It's had its impact in Egypt. So it, we should just be aware that the level of sectarian violence and the consciously using one group against another, um, and particularly trying to mobilize the, the Sunni forces against it was seen as as seen both Iran and also Hezbollah in, in Lebanon, how to try to pull Hamas in, in Gaza, Palestinian struggle away, and, and divide the resistance. And it goes on all the time, and there's a, an intense amount of disinformation and lies that are much more intense than all the lies and stories about gas. I mean, it goes on endlessly and at an, an intense level. So the forces who are standing up to this and saying, it can seem like a religious argument, you know, about the importance of respect for different religions and the importance of respect for diversity and, and, and so on. And 
we'd say, well, we're not religious. Is that important? But it's extremely important when you hear the debate and discussion. It's groups refusing to be used one against the other and also saying this isn't our tradition. Um, I, I could go into that more, but I, I think that this is um, kind of the, the main, the main uh, points for here and, and will be, uh, oh, I, I wanted to also yeah, ask uh, a question about what we see for the future. What does it mean if Syria disarms? Um, the only thing that's under discussion uh, is the chemical weapons. And it, that depends on how far the U.S. wants to push. And you can see it's just an opening point for them. They say, well, it means chemical weapons. It also means the ability to deliver any kind of weaponry and all kinds of armaments. They'll, they'll put the kitchen sink into it if they're allowed. Um, and it's exactly what happened in Iraq, where weapons of mass destruction <coughs> meant that Iraq couldn't import pencils or x-ray machines because there's no form of technology that can't be used to also make a weapon. And a lot of that is also the fraud of the idea of, of weapons of gas are more deadly. When we were there, it was the anniversary of Sabra and Shatila, when I think it was 4,000, somebody can correct me on the number, of Palestinians who were killed by the phalange, the fascist forces, as Israeli troops stood there. But they were o overwhelmingly killed with knives and bayonets, but because they were disarmed and, and, and isolated, it could happen. So it, it's not just one form of weapon is more deadly than another. But in terms of um, Syria being disarmed of chemical weapons, as a state, they for a long time wanted to end the use of chemical weapons. They called for a weapons-free zone. And that was one point that Assad made and others have made, that, that their call in, throughout the whole region, just as others have, as Iran has called for making the region a nuclear-free zone. Who, who brings in the nuclear weapons? Who has the nuclear weapons in the region? It's the U.S. and Israel. And so countries of the region have said, you know, let's disarm. Chemical weapons, nuclear weapons. Who who maintains most of the weapons in the world today? Oh, the overwhelming majority comes from the U.S. And who holds it in the region? Overwhelmingly, the U.S. So, at any rate, I don't think what's at all on the agenda is them uh, disarming their own defense and conventional weapons. And they have been doing um, pretty well in terms of organizing to push back the resistance, uh, the, these, mer it's not resistance, these mercenary bands, these rebel bands. Uh, the government has been doing pretty well at that. I think they'll be able to continue, even though we need to be aware that more sophisticated weapons are coming in. But the danger of a U.S. bombing was what happens when, when that goes on, as we saw in Libya, as we saw in Iraq, as we saw in Yugoslavia. Remember in Yugoslavia, they destroyed 438 schools and 14 tanks. It's easy to hide a tank. For any, heaven's sakes, any haystack will do. But the schools, what had been constructed was the target. That's what was destroyed in Libya. The communications, the electric grid, the Grand Waterway, which was a wonder in Libya. That's what was destroyed. That's what was intended to be destroyed. So the fact that the U.S. was stopping that 90 days of bombing, that they were just, you could feel them thirsting to carry it out, that is important. And it was a collective world movement that did it, and it's why we want to stay on the alert 
to stop that because I, I really do think they can take care of business against all of these groups. Um, the U.S. was so anxious to bomb because all these diverse groups were losing. They haven't been able to really hold any ground unless they can hold ground where they're surrounded by civilians and the government is worried about killing a lot of civilians in order to root them out. So um, I think those answered most of the questions. And in the days ahead, we'll have to figure out how to really um, answer more of these. And I think both stay, stu they stay tuned, know that there's great determination there, and determination will continue here. Thank you.